So greetings and welcome everyone. We will just uh, go straight ahead uh, with the prayers, Refuge, Bodhicitta and Gandhian Lagema in order to adjust the motivation as we do the recitation. Otherwise, if we give too much explanation, it takes a bit of time. So let's do the prayers straight away. Mm-hmm. All right. So last week uh, we talked about uh, um, non-aversion, and we explained that aversion here. So we're looking at the non-aversion, but we explained what aversion means. Aversion refers to hatred. We looked at the etymology of the term shedang, and we said that the first syllable indicates something that comes from the very core, from the very depth of our being. And uh, we have explained that uh, here we're talking about the positive or the virtuous mental factor of non-aversion, meaning not generating anger, not generating aversion. Okay, we explained this last week and now we continue with the next one, which is non-delusion. All right, so non-delusion here, delusion refers to confusion, Uh, not knowing, not understanding, and so forth. So the opposite of that, the non-delusion, really refers to knowledge. And there are many different types of knowledge. So this uh, six uh, virtuous mental factor, the non-confusion, we say it refers to knowledge. So we we understand that there there are many things that we are ignorant about, isn't it? Many things we do not know. So, for example, Geshe says, I don't know English, you don't know Tibetan, and if we want to communicate, we need to have a translator between us, right? Um, So the thing is that um, knowledge removes ignorance. So every time that you come to know or you come to understand something new, you generate a new type of knowledge, which means you remove one portion of ignorance. So eventually with every new thing that you come to know, you have new knowledge, new knowledge, new knowledge. And there will be a time where we come to know everything and we will become all knowing, omniscient. Mm. Okay, so as we say, the six uh, virtues um, mental factor refers to knowledge, and we say that there are many different types of knowledge. So if we see how it is described in the Abhidharma, it is says that it is knowledge and analytical understanding derived from karmic maturation. Uh, so this is one type of knowledge that we can have. It is derived from karmic maturation. Karmic maturation here refers to knowledge that we obtained through birth. In reality, what it refers to is the, the fact that in our previous life, we have studied a particular subject very well. We became expert in that subject. And then when we take another rebirth, we come with this knowledge. So it is as if you are born with this knowledge. It is knowledge derived from karmic maturation. That's one type of knowledge. The second one is um, knowledge derived from scripture. So knowledge derived from scripture is knowledge derived from hearing. The second one, the third one is knowledge derived from contemplation, which is knowledge derived from reflection. And the third one, knowledge derived from realization, which is knowledge derived from meditation. So you can see we have knowledge from previous births. We have knowledge from hearing, from reflecting, and from meditating. And these, the last three, as it says here, they are derived from this, which indicates that we have to put effort in order to generate these types of knowledge. So uh, in brief, we can say here that we are talking about knowledge that is analytical understanding acting as an antidote to ignorance or delusion or confusion, right? And it can be uh, either of two types. Either it is from birth, from karmic maturation, or it is derived. So derived from scripture, from contemplation and realization. Okay, so remember that the actual name of the sixth mental factor is non-delusion, 
right? So when you say, when we explain it, we say it is knowledge that is analytical, um, analytical understanding derived in any of these two ways that acts as the antidote to delusion or to ignorance. So you can see, you have seen here that in this list of mental factors, we have looked at the, the last three that we have looked at, non-attachment, non-aversion, non-delusion. These are actually called the three root virtuous ones. And the three root virtuous ones are extremely important mental factors. If you want to go to reach the state of liberation or the ground of Buddhahood, these are indispensable. These are the things that we must generate. What are the opposites of this? The opposites of this are the three poisons, the three root poisons, isn't it? Which are attachment, hatred, and confusion, right? So we have the three root virtues, and then we have the opposite of those three, which are the three root poisons. Now, usually when we generate any affliction, the instigator or the main motivation is any of the three poisons. So it's either going to be attachment, or it will be hatred, or it will be delusion. So what we're trying to say here is that instead of being motivated by the three poisons, we should be motivated by the three virtuous ones. And those three virtuous ones, it's indispensable. These are things we absolutely have to generate and increase and cultivate if you want to reach the state of Buddhahood. Actually, the presentation of those three, just those three um, root of virtues, mental factors uh, can be very extensive because we say that all virtues phenomena can be included, subsumed, um, subsumed under this presentation. So Geshe says there is a very extensive presentation here, but Geshe says I am not fully qualified to give you this presentation. And because it is so extensive, I think you do not even want to hear it. It's so long. Mm. So it is very important to understand this presentation um, because, you know, for example, we study grounds and paths. Why do we study those? We study those because really we want to learn what are the steps that will lead us to ab abandon the three poisons and their imprints, isn't it? Because any faulty activity or any negative actions of our body, our speech, and our mind that we engage in, we engage it through any of the three root poisons, isn't it? So... Um, you can see that the function of those three root virtuous ones is to support not engaging in negative actions. So it does the opposite of engaging negative actions. So we said that those uh, three, the non-attachment, non-aversion, non-delusion, are extremely important. And actually, if you come to understand those, you will see that they include all phenomena. So we said that this is a very extensive presentation. But just to give you an idea, for the first one, we talk about non-attachment. So non-attachment means you're not attached to this and that object, isn't it? So we can look at it in this way, not attached into this life. If you're not attached in this life, if you are willing to let go or to sacrifice this life, it means you are seeking the next life. You are convinced that the next life is more important. And this is exactly the attitude and the practices of the individual of the small scope as they are presented in the Lambrim. Another level of being not attached, not attached to the glories of uh, cyclic existence. So if you're not attached to this, it means you're seeking liberation. So this actually includes all the practices of the individual of the middle scope. Or if we look at it at another level, not attached, not attached to the two extremes of cyclic existence or Hinayana Nirvana. So if you are not attached to these two extremes, it means 
you are seeking the state of non-abiding nirvana. You're seeking Mahayana nirvana. So this actually includes all the practices of the individual of the great scope. So just the term non-attachment understood at different levels can include all the paths and all the practices of the individual of the small scope, the middle scope, the great scope. This is the whole lam rim, isn't it? So Geshe says, just talking about non-attachment, one should be able to uh, present the entire topic of the lam rim. And this is why Geshe said, I said it is so extensive and I'm not qualified. I, I cannot give you such an extensive presentation. And also from your side, probably you don't have the time to listen to it. To give you another example, in the case of uh, non-delusion, we said that non-delusion really refers to wisdom. And there are two types of wisdom, wisdom from obtained from birth and wisdom that is derived. In the second category that we have derived wisdom, it can be wisdom derived from listening. For example, that is just one derived from listening, derived from contemplation, derived from meditation. So derived from listening is just one type of wisdom. So derived from listening, it means you must listen to something. So what are you listening to? What type of information are you relying upon? So what you listen here is the um, direct speech of the Buddha and the treatises uh, related to the speech of the Buddha, which is actually, in other words, you're relying into Buddha's words, which is uh, very extensive. Right, So the Buddha has taught this and this and this, and we have this treatise, we have this commentary, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, a way to present it, uh, like a different presentation, is to look at the classification. So we say that these are uh, the speech of the Buddha is uh, classified in 12 branches. If you want to consolidate it, it can be consolidated into nine branches. Then those nine branches can be further consolidated into the three baskets, the three pitakas. So we can say, you know, how you, when we talk about wisdom derived from hearing, what are you hearing? So you are hearing the three pitakas. The, all these materials. So Geshe says you can see how vast each one of these is. So if we we talk about wisdom derived from listening, and we said that it refers to the actual teachings of the Buddha and the commentaries uh, that explain their meaning. But if we don't go down this way, we can say that um, ultimately it comes down to the three pitakas, the three baskets. So what are those three baskets? So we have the Vinaya pitaka. We have the Abhidharma Pitaka and we have the Sutra Pitaka. So the three Pitakas actually indicate to us the three types of higher training. So the training, what we need to train in. So the, uh, the um, uh, what it is, the first one, the Vinaya, the Vinaya Pitaka is the one that is the higher training in ethics. The Sutra Pitaka is the higher training in concentration. And the Abhidharma Pitaka is the higher training in wisdom, right? So training in wisdom and wisdom have the same meaning. Training in concentration and concentration is the same meaning and so forth. So in other words, here we are told what we need to train in. We need to train in ethics, in concentration, and wisdom. But the important thing here is that our training should be done in the correct order and in an unmistaken fashion. So it is very important that we don't confuse the order of things. We don't try to start from anywhere we like. The correct order is to begin with training in ethics, from that training in concentration and from that training in wisdom. So if you train and practice in the correct order, you will reach the state of Buddha. 
So if we see the meaning of here, what is uh, communicated is that, first of all, we have to rely on listening. So we have to go and listen a lot. We must accumulate a lot of information. So first of all, through this process, we will generate or we cultivate the wisdom derived from listening. After we have listened to this information, it is important that we analyze it in order to induce some certainty. So this is the second phase, which is cultivating the wisdom derived from analysis. And then once we have reached um, a certainty on a particular meaning, we need to meditate on it. So in this uh, third stage of meditation, we need to engage both types of meditation, placement and analytical meditation. So just as we say that we need to alternate and combine method and wisdom, similarly here, we say that we need to alternate between placement and analytical meditation because each one of them individually will not allow us to properly complete the path, right? So, for example, we say that from within the stability or the placement of calm abiding, we have to investigate in order to develop the special insight, isn't it? So from within analysis, we have to then introduce, from within stability, we have to introduce um, analysis. So we have to alternate between the two. So uh, the intention of the great um, path breakers, such as the masters Nagarjuna and Asanga and so forth, is that you will be able to, when you practice by following the complete entire path, complete entire path me here means you're not practicing only one side of the path, right? You're doing it comp in a complete fashion, including everything that needs to be included. So practicing the entire path is the way to please the Buddhas. And this is actually the intention of the Buddhas. This is when they presented the path, it was intended to be practiced in this complete and wholesome fashion. So they, they are advised to us is that we should be very careful, follow the correct steps, include everything, alternate where we need to alternate. And in this way, if we do it correctly, we will proceed to the state of Buddhahood. So it says that this is the practicing in this way is what pleases the mind of the Buddha. It is also the intention of uh, the great path uh, uh, breakers. And uh, if we do not practice in this way, it means that even though we have obtained this precious human rebirth, we are actually wasting this opportunity. Therefore, it is important to um, induce analytical understanding, meaning examine everything that has been presented, analyze everything that has been presented so far, develop that understanding and uh, generate resolution. So we have talked about resolution, right? Having this aspiration, not exactly aspiration, comes before aspiration, but find the qualities in this presentation, recognizing the qualities and thinking that this is what you want to practice. This is how you want to practice. Because if you don't do it this way, you are wasting this precious human rebirth. So if we were to look at the importance of wisdom, we can look at the, the verse in the classical text that says, the first five perfection, they are like the blind. And so it's talking about the, the perfection of uh, generosity, uh, ethics, patience, enthusiastic effort, up to concentration. So the first five are like the blind men, whilst the perfection of wisdom is like the guide who possesses eyes. Okay, so the difference between them is very stark, is very obvious. Therefore, it says the first five alone do not reach the state of Buddhahood. Why don't they reach the state of Buddhahood? Well, because they are blind. If you're blind, you don't know which direction you're heading to. 
So if you're blind, what you need to do is you need to combine with a guide and your guide must have eyes. It's the one with the eyes that will lead you to Buddhahood or lead you to your destination. So in this context, he's giving the advice that we must combine, we must have the union of method and wisdom because it says the first five are like blind and therefore you need to combine them with a perfection of wisdom that has the eyes. So combine method with wisdom. But from in this group of six, which one is the most important? It is the perfection of wisdom. It's the one with the eyes. So Geshe says, I think now you have come to understand the importance of those three mental factors, the non-attachment, non-aversion, non-delusion. And if you have come to understand their importance, please apply them, please use them. So Geshe is saying, I have explained those three and I'm urging you to please uh, put them into action. The thing is that if we can practice relying on those three root virtues, mental factors, it will be amazing. However, we must keep in mind that our ignorance is extremely thick and we live during degenerative times. So we are like constantly and deeply confused. Therefore, for us, it is very difficult to practice pure Dharma. And since this is the situation, we really have to be honest and we really have to think very carefully about the time of our death. Now, ideally, at the time of our death, and you hear the instruction, it is very good to place the mind on your own virtuous friend or on your Buddha. So we want to uh, generate absorption or concentration in that. The actual uh, etymology of the term for concentration is some ten. So some, the first part, means think or put the mind, place the mind somewhere, think about this. And the ten means stable. So it means place your mind on that particular focal object and remain there very stably. So this is what concentration is. So ideally, we should be cultivating concentration, stable concentration of the mind on our teacher or on, on our like root guru or on our teacher Buddha Shakyamuni. So when we say cultivate concentration or absorption on that is like meditate on the face of the teacher or meditate on the advice of the teacher of the speech, because what do they do? tell us what do they teach us they teach us to abandon negativity and they tell us they urge us to cultivate virtue isn't it so the plan for the time of death is to be able at that time to place the mind stay with great stability very firmly upon the teacher, whether it is Buddha Shakyamuni or whether it is your root guru. Because if you place the mind stably there and you pass away your last, you breathe your last breath in this way, it is guaranteed that we will get a good rebirth. Now, in order to be able to do this at the time of death, we actually have to train ourselves. So Geshe says, I urge you, starting from today, every day in the morning, dedicate a few minutes just to focus, just to meditate upon the teacher. If you don't start doing that type of meditation now, you will not have familiarity, meaning you will not be able to do it at the time of your death. Right? So it is very important. We talk a lot about poor, doing the practice of poor. So the poor means transference. Transference means we die from this life and we will have to transfer in another life, right? And there are many elaborate techniques and you will have to have visualizations and start saying the home and the pay and so forth. But here we want the most simple poor practice, the most simple poor practice and the supreme for that reason is to meditate on the guru. That's it. 
So we all have a lot of negativity. And there is, a, it's almost certain, if we don't do something about it at the time of death, our next rebirth will be in the hells, or in any case, it will be in one of the three unfortunate migrations. So it will be a really great benefit if we could have that simple meditation at the time of death, focusing on the guru, isn't it? Which at least will stop us from falling into the hells. That would be great benefit, isn't it? Geshe says, I mentioned it today. It's an opportunity to mention it. You just don't know when you will become sick. You don't know when sickness will strike. And you want to be prepared. At the time of death, you want to have a bulletproof, unfailing, easy, best power practice. So this is it. Mm. So Geshe says, we don't know when we will die. It is the time of our death is uncertain. So it will be very good if we could uh, have a method that at least guarantees that I in, we are not going to fall into the lower migrations. Then we can have like the, the, the hope or the expectation for another good rebirth. And then we can continue our training from there. So Geshe says, this is... Uh, that's the reason why I mentioned it. It's very important. We we'll continue with the next one, which is the seventh mental factor. And this one is enthusiastic effort. So what is this enthusiastic effort? It takes delight in virtue. So if you want to remember something, this is the short definition, delight in virtue. Okay, that is either... And now we're going to mention different types of enthusiastic effort. Armored, applied, undaunted, irreversible, insatiable. Um, so these are different types. And what is its function? Its function is to accomplish and complete. If you have enthusiastic effort, whatever is your plan, whatever is your goal, you will be able to see that to the end. So it means you will be able to accomplish it. You will complete it. But if you don't have enthusiastic effort, it means what will take um, over, what will overtake you is the opposite of enthusiastic effort, which is laziness. And we know that when laziness takes over us, we are not able to complete or to accomplish whatever is the task. So important thing about enthusiastic effort is to have this delight in virtue. So the important thing here is, uh, which we have mentioned before, that when we use this term effort or enthusiastic effort, it is very specific. It only refers to having delight for virtuous activities. Otherwise, like in uh, colloquial language, in everyday language, we say, oh, you know, this task re requires a lot of effort. This is not enthusiastic effort. This is a striving right? Working hard for a particular activity. For example, building a house or cultivating a field. It takes a lot of effort, right? But it is not enthusiastic effort. It is not enthusiastic effort. And although um, the average person calls this effort, and they might even describe it as being enthusiastic, the thing is that it is one of the categories of laziness. One of the three types of laziness is the laziness of being attracted to negative activities. Negative activity here is any activity that um, directs you away from the virtuous activity. So instead of practicing pure dharma, you direct your resources and time and energy and all your activities to gardening, let's say, all right? So it's a form of laziness. It's not enthusiastic effort. Okay, so we mentioned here that we have different types of enthusiastic effort. We'll begin with explaining those. The first one is armored. So it is like an armor. Okay, so let's see. What is the armor? The armor, so obviously it's an analogy here, right? So when you go to war, and in particular in the past, all the, the soldiers would put on the armor. And the function of the armor is, stop, is to stop any arrows 
from penetrating your body. Okay, so similarly, so it's there to protect you. So harm does not um, does not reach you, right? So similarly here, when you have a virtuous activity and you say, I will engage in this virtuous activity, you have to mentally prepare yourself because when we engage in those activities, there will be obstacles, there will be difficulties. And if mentally you are weak, if mentally you are unprotected, unprepared, it means that all these difficulties will get into you. It, it's almost like you will be wounded by these difficulties, okay? So prior to engaging in the activity, you prepare your mind and your mind, your mental attitude becomes your armor. So you decide before you engage in the activity that come what may, I don't care how difficult it is, I will not let any of these difficulties and obstacles stop me. I will just persevere through all of this. So it is the armor of your enthusiastic effort. So as we say here, it is your mental attitude that will protect you and will become your armor. In Lama Chopa, we have this verse that comes in the context of talking about the perfection of enthusiastic effort. And it says, even if I were to be reborn in the deepest hell of a Vichy uh, over many lifetimes for the sake of each one sentient beings, may I never lose my uh, courage and continue with enthusiastic effort. So this is actually an example of having put on the armor of enthusiastic effort. So you understand that this is going to be a very difficult training and you prepare yourself mentally and you say, even for the sake of each sentient being, if I had to fall into the hells, I will not let go of this path of this training. So that is the armor of enthusiastic effort. The second one, the second type of enthusiastic effort is applied. Applied, or you could say preliminary. You know how we have the preliminary, then the actual part, then the conclusion? So it's what happens on the preliminary. So it says here that we must have enthusiastic effort on the preliminary effort, uh, stage, meaning before you actually engage the activity, you have to prepare yourself. How do you prepare? Prepare yourself, prepare yourself by having this enthusiasm, having the mind that says, I like this activity. So having that liking, that delight for the activity is the preparatory enthusiastic effort. In terms of preparatory enthusiastic effort, there are two types. There is the constant and there is the intermittent. Constant means you always make that effort to uh, that effort of preparation. Um, and the other one, the intermittent, it means sometimes you need to do that preparation of generating this enthusiasm for the activity, and sometimes you don't. Um, okay, we come to the next one. The next type is called undaunted. Undaunted means uh, you are not deflated and in a sense, you are not scared. So to give you an example, we hear that uh, to reach the state of Buddhahood will take a very long time. It will take three countless great eons. So you hear that and you say, oh, no, you know, how could I keep going for three countless great eons? It's extremely long. You know, it's not for me. That practice is not for me. Or even the other example we gave with uh, calm abiding, that we said if you have the right conditions and all the causes, if you meditate, we can you can get it in six months. And there are people who say, what? It will take six months. It's just like too long. It's too difficult. Sometimes when we talk, uh, for example, about the suffering in of the hells, you see he, people become so frightened, like they, they lose, uh, what can I say? You know, they lose heart, right? So people don't even want to hear, or they don't even want to contemplate 
the suffering of the lower rebirth. So this indicates a type of mind that is weak, it's intimidated, is daunted by the task, all right? So here we talk about enthusiastic effort that is undaunted, means you're not scared. It doesn't scare you, even though it is um, something very, very big, a very big task. So um, we're looking from uh, an extract from the Jataka Tales, where it says, when you are um, overtaken or defeated uh, by, in, by this mind that is intimidated, you will never reach the state of liberation. Thinking I will never be able to do it, um, you actually... Um, liberation becomes unobtainable. Instead of doing this, you should rely on those who are wise and those who are holy beings. By relying on their explanation, they will be able to clarify and make that which appears to be very difficult as something which is easy and achievable. Therefore, without having a deflated mind, generate the attitude says, they did it in this and that way. I will also do it in this way. Okay, so what this indicates is that if you develop that mind that is defeated from the very beginning, before you even engage the activity, it means, it means you will not go anywhere. You will not re reach anywhere. Indeed, you know, the path is difficult and we are untrained. So for this reason, we should be uh, quite skillful, right? We should find a skillful way through this. And the skillful thing to do is not to just throw your hands up and say, oh, it's too difficult. Oh, it would take too long. Oh, I don't know how to do it. Therefore, it's unobtainable. That's not very skillful. And the skillful is to go and rely on holy beings, on the advice of holy beings, on the advice of those who are wise, because they have done it and they know how to do it and they can explain it. As it says, through their, their, their explanation, they make that which is very difficult to appear easy. So this is the skillful thing to do. Go and get some advice. And once you get this advice, then you need to generate that attitude and say, oh, all right, they did it this way, so I am also going to do it in this way. They were successful. I will follow their advice and I will do it. So all of us, we begin as ignorant. We are untrained. So all of us need to train. Therefore, we need to go and find the proper instruction. Okay, we come to the fourth type of uh, enthusiastic effort, which is irreversible. Irreversible here, it means that despite the different, the difficulties and the adverse conditions that you encounter, these conditions cannot uh, make you change course, right? So they cannot call, cause you to diverse. You remain irreversible. You remain on course. So Jeremy actually gives us advice in terms of enthusiastic effort. And it says, in order to be irreversible and find stability, you need to don the armor. So put on the armor of enthusiastic effort. And if you do this, all the qualities of... Um, uh, all the qualities, uh, the realizations of... Um, uh, transmitted and realized dharma will increase like the waxing moon. All your behavior um, will turn out to be good. Any activity that you undertake will be properly completed and uh, achieved. And uh, any, any other activity that you do that requires effort will come to a good conclusion. It uh, will uh, stop. So he's talking about enthusiastic effort here. It says it will stop um, laziness. And for this reason, this great, all the bodhisattvas put effort in cultivating this great wave of enthusiastic effort. 
All right. We come now to the last, the fifth type of enthusiastic effort, insatiable. Insatiable means you are not satisfied. You are not contented with how much you have, which is the exact opposite in our case. In our case, we study a little bit or we train in something, and very quickly we generate this idea that, oh, I have finished this subject, I have completed this, I know this, right? But really, Gesha says, if you ask the question, to be honest, what have you finished? What have you completed in terms of study, in terms of education? Isn't it even even on the um, on a on the level of uh, grammar or words and so forth languages? Have we completed anything? Have we perfected anything? In terms of the training of the six perfections, have we completed any of them? Even the first one, like generosity, let alone the second one, <laughs> enthusiastic effort, and so forth. Have we completed any of those things? Even down to mundane knowledge, uh, such as knowing how to cook. Have we completed? Do we know how to cook every dish? No, we don't. Because in every part of the world, there is so much, there's different food, different cuisine, isn't it? Okay. So from our side, we are very easily satisfied. We have a very small mind, very narrow-minded attitude. However, what we need to have here is great, in a sense, great ambition, isn't it? Insatiable appetite for more knowledge from more quality. Like I have one quality, I want more. I want to add to my qualities. That should be the attitude. Um, so Lama Tsum Kappa is actually giving us further advice where he says, uh, the way that we study is very partial. Usually we only study one small portion or one part of the path, but we do not have the interest to understand the full body of the path. And because our understanding and our study is limited and partial, uh, this actually becomes an impediment into completing or being able to properly practice is the path. So in Lamrin Chenmo, um, Lama Tsongkhapa says, for example, look at Master Asanga. Although he had an excellent understanding of, of how to practice the vast path in its entirety, he was never satisfied with the qualities or the understanding he had. So he kept saying again and again, I still need to listen. I still need to reflect. So uh, Lama Tsongkhapa says it is important that our approach is not partial and that we should keep looking for the complete body of the path in its entirety, always wishing to add new qualities to the ones that we already have. So we should always, we should follow this advice and always seek to add, to increase the qualities and the understanding that we have. Geshe says, uh, it is, a, it, actually it's a lie to say, I have finished this subject, I have graduated, I don't need to study anymore. It's a lie. And yet you hear people say it. And many times you hear people say, oh, I have graduated. I've graduated from school or I graduated from college. I don't need to study anymore. This is not true. Until we reach the state of Buddhahood, we need to keep learning. We need to keep training. If you haven't reached the state of Buddhahood yet, you're not qualified to say, I don't need to study. I don't need to train anymore. And if you say this, it's a lie. Hmm. So we see the function of enthusiastic effort is to accomplish and complete virtuous actions, right? So what does that tell you? It tells you that if you have enthusiastic effort, you will be able to establish every virtuous goal that you have. And by establishing one after the other after the other, at the end, you will have the complete collection of those things. So if we look at this sentence in terms of the opposite, 
it is tell you if you don't have enthusiastic effort, you will not accomplish and you will not complete. Also, in entering the middle way, it says all qualities are derived from enthusiastic effort. Therefore, enthusiastic effort is extremely important. So what does it say here? It says that if you want to generate qualities, you have to understand from where these qualities come. They come from enthusiastic effort. And that implies that all of those qualities and the goals and all the things we want to achieve, they don't come easily. You must work very hard for them. And you need the effort that comes with enthusiasm in order to achieve them. So actually, it will be very good if we had the inclination and if we had the opportunity to study the sections uh, in the classical texts that talk about enthusiastic effort. So, for example, in the text of Protector Matria or in Abhidharma, there is excellent presentation of enthusiastic effort. But the information is there, but the problem is that we don't have the time or we don't have the aspiration to even study those texts. So it is said that if you cannot look at those texts for whatever reason, then the next uh, best option is to look at the Lamrim. So you can look at Lamrim Chenmo by Lama Tsongkhapa, where it has a very good presentation of enthusiastic effort. It talks about the benefits of relying on enthusiastic effort, the shortcomings of not relying on enthusiastic effort, the... Um, um, the opposing uh, in conditions, which is uh, the laziness, especially the laziness of being attracted to negative activities, and also the way what is favorable in terms of um, achieving or cultivating enthusiastic effort, the way of obtaining enthusiastic effort by relying on four powers and so forth. So if you want to know about enthusiastic effort and cannot study the great classical texts, at least look at Lamrim Chenmo. Also, you can find this information in other Lamrim, like uh, the liberation in the palm of your hand and so forth. Find that section on enthusiastic effort and study it and understand it as best as you can. We continue with the next one in our list. Number eight is pliancy. So what is pliancy? It is physical and mental flexibility that severs the continuum of physical and mental dysfunction. All right. So in other words, this tells us that we have two types of pliancy. We have physical pliancy and we have mental pliancy. So when we talk about physical pliancy, it means that we have this flexibility. So when we want to engage any virtuous activity, we will be able to do it for however long it is, whatever time of the day or night it is, and for however long it, it takes, right? So no tiredness whatsoever. So that is physical pliancy, physical flexibility. And then we have the mental pliancy, which refers to this mental attitude where, again, there is like no resistance to engaging a virtuous activity and there is no deflated mind. The mind is not disappointed. The mind is not dragging along. The mind is not tired and so forth. Okay, so basically when we talk about pliancy, we talk about this flexibility. So why is this the case? It is because pliancy is actually the antidote to laziness. Okay, what happens with the case of laziness? Why do we experience laziness? We experience laziness because, let's say, you want to engage a, a physical a virtuous activity and the body becomes tired. And when the body becomes tired, there's something that tells you you want to stop. You don't want to do it anymore. Or similarly, when the mind becomes tired, there is that resistance. Resistance comes um, means laziness. You don't want to do the activity anymore. So pliancy is the antidote to all that. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about pliancy. So pliancy, um, by focusing on uh, uh, any chosen focal, virtuous focal object, it severs the continuum of seeds of inflexibility of body and afflicted states of mind progressively and constitute a physical, that constitute physical and mental dysfunction. So what pliancy does in terms of body and mind is that it severs the continuum of physical and mental dysfunction. So dysfunction here, physical dysfunction, it refers both to activities of the body and the speech, which are negative activities, basically. And the mental dysfunction is negative mental activities. So, you know, entertaining negative thoughts and so forth. So pliancy is able to progressively stop those things, stop this dysfunction, physical and mental dysfunction. And uh, that allows you to engage any uh a virtuous focal object that you choose. So uh, it, at the point, at this point, at present, we do not have this flexibility because we do not have that pliancy. You you see, you know, you, you search for a good focal object. You cannot even engage it. When we had the presentation of calm abiding, we said that you obtain the fully qualified calm abiding when you are able to engage whatever is your chosen focal object. So it means you have full choice of virtuous focal object here. You decide which one you want and the mind immediately straight away goes into that object and remains um, because you experience that bliss of physical and mental pliancy. So until the bliss of physical and mental pliancy is generated, you do not have the fully qualified calm abiding. Mm. So when uh, we talk about uh, uh, developing the bliss of physical and mental pliancy, when you first obtain this, this is the time when you first obtain calm abiding. If we look at the writings of Lama Tsongkhapa, when he talks about the benefits of obtaining this pliancy, he says, um, the concentration of the mind is like a king. So like a king, means it's the one that actually controls the mind. You have full control of your mind at this point. If you place it, it remains immovable like a mountain. So once you choose a focal object and you decide, I want to engage that focal object, you will just remain with this like a mountain. Nothing is going to redirect you somewhere else. If you send it, it engages all object. So it is your choice here. And you say, I want to send my mind to engage this and that object. Everything is within reach. Everything you want to engage, you just send the mind there and it can engage it. Uh, and then it says it is characterized by total flexibility of body and mind. So all of these are the benefits of this mental factor of pliancy. So we say that the time where we first obtain the bliss of physical and mental pliancy, this is the time where we obtain calm abiding. Calm abiding is actually an amazing type of mind to obtain because it can become a very good, very stable foundation from within which you can then engage in other types of analytical meditation. So, for example, you can meditate on compassion, you can meditate on impermanence, you can meditate on bodhicitta, you can meditate on emptiness, you can um, develop special insight. These, all of those are types of analytical meditation. But the thing is that it makes a huge difference if you engage in analytical meditation, uh, if you have that stability of calm abiding. At present, we don't have that stability of calm abiding. So whatever meditation we do is a case of hit and miss. 
right? You try to do placement meditation and what happens? The mind does not stay there. The mind just goes here and there. You try to do analytical meditation and although you're supposed to be analyzing, I don't know, impermanence or emptiness or whatever you're supposed to be analyzing, again, you do like one or two minutes of analysis and the next minute the mind has moved to something else. But if you have calm abiding as the basis, calm abiding is the basis that makes sure that the mind stays here. So whether you're doing placement meditation or whether you're doing analytical meditation, you're not going to be distracted to something else. You're just going to stay here, right? So having doing any meditation on the basis of calm abiding is like your arrow hitting the bull's eye every time. We come to the next one. It's the ninth in the list. Uh, um, sometimes it is translated as diligence, sometimes as conscientiousness. So basically, it means to be very careful. The opposite of this mental factor is careless. And we know that when we are careless, we engage in all sorts of uh, negative activities. So, all right, so what is this diligence or this conscientiousness is that which maintains non-attachment, non-aversion, non-delusion and effort and cultivates virtue states and protects the mind from contaminated phenomena. Its function it is to accomplish and complete um, state and complete states and, um, sorry, uh, to accomplish and complete all excellent mundane and transcendent states. Mm. All right, so what is this uh, mental factor? So it says that it makes sure that the mind does not go into the area of affliction because it maintains non-attachment, non-aversion, non-delusion, right? The other thing is that it maintains effort so it makes you remain with enthusiastic effort and protects the mind from contaminated phenomena. So we say, remember, we say the opposite of this is careless. So what happens here is you have something that protects the mind and makes you avoid contaminated phenomena and makes you avoid any affliction and at the same time makes you maintain your enthusiastic effort. Mm -hmm. So there is this function here that protects you. It means it stops you. So you are about to engage in a negative activity. So let's say you are about to say a lie or you are about to entertain a negative thought. But there is some mental factor that stops you, brings you back and in this way protects you. And this is called diligence or conscientiousness. It's a very important mental factor. We need to recognize it and we need to rely upon it because it is described um, in this way. Without allowing us to be careless, since through carelessness, all negativity increases, it is something that stops negativities of body, speech and mind causing virtuous mind to increase, and therefore we should always be diligent or conscientious. So you can see the importance of this mental factor. All right, we stop here for today. We run out of time. <laughs>